Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am, I am not too proud to beg for applause. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rich Bury. I have the deep honor of being the CEO of Robinhood. And I am so glad to welcome you here to our 34th annual Heroes Breakfast. Welcome. You know, at Robinhood, we believe in the American dream. But we also know that that dream is a work in progress. But we also believe that New York City can be at the vanguard of making the American dream the American reality. As New York City's largest poverty-fighting organization, Robin Hood has prob proudly invested over $3 billion to educate, employ, house, and support New Yorkers over the past 35 years. And none of that extraordinary work would be possible without the people in this room. As you all know, Robin Hood is all about New York City, and we're here today to celebrate some amazing New Yorkers. But before we do, I want to take a moment to talk about what's happening across the globe. Uh, my hero, and probably the hero of many of you, Reverend Martin Luther King, once wrote, all men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. That's why as New Yorkers, we feel the pain of Hamas's brutal attacks in Israel a month and a half ago. We mourn those who were murdered and pray for the return of those held hostage. We demand justice and peace for the victims, their families, and their loved ones. As New Yorkers, we mourn the loss of civilian life in Gaza. We are overwhelmed by their pain and suffering and our hearts break for our fellow human beings. As New Yorkers, we grieve with our many neighbors who have lost loved ones during this conflict. And as New Yorkers, we stand against hate in all of its forms, especially now with anti-Semitism and Islamophobia on the rise. Because we know that we can't be a city of opportunity if we're not a city where everyone feels and is safe. I think this all hits us a little differently in New York because we know what it's like to experience a terrorist attack that shatters the world as we know it. And the thing that I most remember from the days after 9-11, and really after every crisis our city has faced, whether it's Superstorm Sandy to the pandemic, it's that crisis breeds courage. At Robin Hood, we find courage in the organizations that open their doors to welcome and serve our community. We find courage in those New Yorkers who take every opportunity to build a better life for themselves, even against extraordinary odds. And we find courage in all of you, people who are willing to step up and invest year after year in the fabric and the future of our extraordinary city in good times and in bad times. Today, we celebrate those heroes, the people who make New York City the greatest city in the world. I want to start by celebrating someone who's been a hero to me, a hero to Robin Hood, and a hero to children. When Marion Wright Edelman, founder of the Children's Defense Fund, joined Robin Hood's board in 1993. She'd already, she had already dedicated her life to building a better America for our children. After becoming the first black woman to be admitted to the Mississippi Bar, Marion served as an attorney at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and helped coordinate Dr. King's vision for the Poor People's Campaign. Under her leadership, the Children's Defense Fund has grown to become the nation's strongest voice for children and families. Her 30 years of leadership on our board have been essential to making Robin Hood the organization that we are. Uh, Marin is transitioning to the Emeritus Board, uh, so she's stepping off the Board of Directors. Uh, and today, as she transitions, we are proud to name a Heroes Award in her honor.
Uh, Marion couldn't join us today, but I know she feels all the love and admiration in this room. And so I now have the privilege to introduce this morning's first honoree, who also happens to be the first recipient of the Marion Wright Edelman Heroes Award. Right now, 1.4 million New Yorkers live in poverty. And if you're black, Latino, or Asian, that's more than twice as likely to be true. 62,000 of those New Yorkers sleep in shelter every night. Even though we know that giving people housing vouchers, uh, so government subsidies that help you pay your rent, uh, can help keep people in their homes and out of shelter, we also know that only 25% of the people who have housing vouchers are able to use them. A big part of the problem is that many landlords illegally refuse to accept housing vouchers because they want to keep low-income New Yorkers out of their buildings or out of their neighborhoods. It's one of the reasons why, despite the big investments that our city and state have made in rental assistance, the average family who enters a homeless shelter in New York has a stay of over 400 days. Even when people have the money to rent a home, a legal discrimination can stop them from doing so. Drawing on the legacy of civil rights leaders like Dr. King, who used testing to prove race-based housing discrimination, about four years ago, Robin Hood began partnering with the Fair Housing Justice Center to test for discrimination based on the use of rental vouchers here in New York City. FJHC hires and trains testers who pose as prospective tenants, some with housing vouchers and some who don't, to detect whether people are treated differently by landlords, by agents, and by property managers when they're seeking apartment. This type of testing is really the only way to uncover the sophisticated discrimination and the subtle method of discrimination that can keep people out of stable housing. FJC, FHJC does more than prove that discrimination exists. They're committed to doing something about it. They've helped countless New Yorkers enforce their housing rights and their work has opened 80,000 units, 80,000 units of housing to low-income tenants. And it's helped, yeah, applause for that. <laughs> We've also helped secure 54 million in damage and penalties that go into the pockets of low-income New Yorkers. For taking people from shelter to stable housing, it is my honor to present the Marion Wright Edelman Robin Hood Hero Award to the Fair Housing Justice Center and Nana Zakia. Well, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. And that's what every family needs to start out with a beautiful morning and a beautiful day, a warm house nice breakfast, good parents and family. Oh, Lord the mercy, let me start this. It's kind of emotional today, it's my mom's birthday as well. So I'm celebrating that Scorpio. My name is Nana Zakia. I'm a New Yorker. I lived here mostly all of my life. I was raised in Harlem by hardworking people. My mother was the head nurse at Harlem Hospital for 35 years, and my father was a hospital police sergeant for 25. There were four of us kids, and I'm the oldest, so you know what that means. We were kids from the projects before the projects got a bad rep. We grew up good in the 1960s and 70s, when everyone looked after everyone, and nobody dared to try to beat up anybody's mama. And if Miss Ann saw you skipping school, there was no threatening her, no telling her to mind her business. You just got to step in line, get to getting and step in line and pray that your mama didn't hear the news when you got home. If you know anything that is useful, no. As a matter of fact, it was Miss Ann Hmm, Anna Thompson, who got me into teaching dance. I was 16, and I didn't think I had much to offer just learning dance for the last three years, going to classes, doing my thing. 
And she said, well, if you know anything, have any kind of knowledge, and someone doesn't, then you are the teacher. You just taught somebody. Just teach what you know. I took that with me. So I started teaching dance and theater and opening up the doors and the minds of all of our children in the same projects I grew up in. I started working with several nonprofits in the community. I led and worked after school programs, police athletic league, summer camp, day camp programs. I had my own radio and cable show. I was interviewing politicians, civic leaders, people doing positive things, not only in Harlem, but throughout New York, wherever we were. In 2001, I went and I moved to Africa for about seven years. I went to work with an organization called the Women of Proverbs 8. Look up, Proverbs 8. Seven years later, I had to come back. My mother was sick, she was suffering from cancer, and I had to come back and take care of her until she died. And then, after she died, being who I am, I started taking care of another elder that I grew up with, with all my life. Knew my mama, knew my grandma, knew my daddy, knew my sisters and my brothers. I started taking care of her. Her children had abandoned her. There's a thing going on now. It's called elder parent abandonment. A lot of people are leaving their elder parents behind because they got their lives, they're moved to other cities, and they don't have the time. Somebody picks up the slack. And so it was me with this particular elder. So I helped her. I fixed up the house. I lived with her, tended to her daily needs. And for, two, for three years, it was just, just us, just her and me. Then she died in the middle of the pandemic of April 2020. Then all of a sudden, her children came back to claim the apartment and began threatening me. I had to leave in fear for my own life at the height of the pandemic. I spent the next three years from 2020 until 2023 shuffling through the shelter system from Brooklyn to the Bronx to Queens, get up, move, right, left, like a soldier, just take those orders, never knowing what's gonna happen, the inconsistency. Here I am, 67 years old, living like I was 17, unable to go to places because the shelters have curfews and you have to ask permission if you can stay out and do whatever it is that you need to do, write a letter, a lot of stuff I'm not used to because I'm 67, not 17. I had no space to dance, no room to store my instruments, and I couldn't cook my healthy foods while I was in the shelter. I was in pain and I needed surgery. But how can you have surgery when you're going back to the shelter to recover? <laughs> so many people in the shelter system are broken spirited. I had already been attacked twice. I didn't tell anybody I was homeless. Just keep on doing what I'm doing, silent. The stigma is real. And I knew folks couldn't help me anyway. Everybody's going through their stuff. No need to stress the ones that love you. So you just suffer in silence. I was like an albatross, you know, that bird that flies and circles Bents the globe twice in two months, never to land. That was me. Then somewhere in the shelter system, I finally met a wonderful social worker. Her name was Valerie. And she said to me, I promise if you apply for Section 8, you're going to get the voucher. <laughs> to a skeptical me, you know how many times I tried for that Section 8 and got rejected? Okay, let's go. Let's do this. Had a little faith in her. and She had a little more than faith in me. And then the voucher came. Wow. It was good. I found an apartment, but it was very tiny. It was a three-story walk-up. And I still hadn't had the surgery. 
So she went with me, and then it was the agent that was showing me the apartment. He said, listen, let me help you. He started calling landlords. I got this client. She works. She's a nice lady. She has a voucher. But every time he mentioned the word voucher by phone or text, they would give him runaround. And then they would ghost him and not Casper either. These places ask you to prove that you have income at least 40 to 50 times the rent. But my voucher covered the rent, so why wasn't I getting an apartment? It's guaranteed. And there's never a guarantee, especially in these days, that any tenant can keep a job or keep a home. I've learned a lot of lessons. As a black woman, I've experienced my share of discrimination, but income discrimination is hidden and it's hard to find and to prove. There's nothing strange and there's something strange going on, the agent said. So he connected me to Fair Housing Justice System. When I got to Fair Housing Justice Center, they had said, well, we're going to do some testing. We're going to find out what's going on. And I was like, well, it's going to take about 10 years. Hmm. Get that going. Anyway, they did 14 different testers, and they applied for the same apartments that I was interested in to see if there was any pattern based on source income. Well, now the evidence came overwhelming. We have a case here. Okay, said Elizabeth of FHJC. They introduced me to my lawyer, Deborah Kapakin, and I felt like I had a team. I'm telling you, I felt like I had a team of wonder women behind me. They just put that lasso of truth and they hit those landlords and they wrangled them in and they had to come clean that they did me wrong. Sometimes rescuers need a rescue. It's like Superman is glad that Jimmy Olsen followed him around and took the kryptonite out of the room. <laughs> healers need healers. And I needed to lean on somebody. I'm not used to that because I'm always giving, you know how that is. And let me tell you, FAJC, they let me lean on them. We filed a lawsuit in August of 2022, and less than a year later, we leveraged the power of the pending lawsuit to get me an apartment in one of the buildings I now love. For the past five months, I've been living in a one-bedroom apartment in Crooklyn, Brooklyn. If my Harlem friends could see me now. I'm over there with Spike Lee. Not just any neighborhood, but what FHJC calls a high-opportunity neighborhood. And I can tell you, that's exactly how it feels. It's not far from the beach. I'm a beach girl. I love it and it's safe and it's clean. I appreciate everything that y'all have done for me. FHJC, Wonder Women with that lasso. Keep wrangling everybody in so they can be happy. I appreciate you. The first day that I put the key in the door, I was surrounded by all these boxes. You know, when you're moving in, you got all these boxes and you're looking at them. And you're just like, what am I going to do? How am I going to start this? This is a job. I was like, okay. Spirit said to me, start with your health. So I opened up the box of kitchen stuff. That's what the box said, kitchen stuff. And inside there was a rice cooker my mama brought me as a housewarming gift. When I came back to Africa, I never opened it up. I just never opened it. I could hear her voice the day that she told me I needed that rice cooker. 
Nana, you need a rice cooker. You be cooking and doing all this stuff every day. You, you need to do something fast. I know how to cook rice. Ma, I don't need no rice cooker. No, you always doing something. You're going to need a rice cooker to do something fast. You know how your mama talked to you, right? So I was like, OK. She visited me in New York, and then she left New York. And then the next thing I know, came the rice cooker. I put it away. I never used it because I was still old fashioned. But here it was three years in the shelter system. And my mom's was there with me. It was like, I was having a housewarming. Excuse me. And my mama was there with me. There was nobody else. And I appreciate that mother's love coming out and reaching out from beyond the grave and letting me know I was okay, that I, I was strong. I made it through the storm. I appreciated that. I cried for 15 minutes, but I'm not going to cry here for 15 minutes. <laughs> Even though today's her birthday, thank you, Robin Hood. <laughs> thank you for being the merry men and making sure that people like myself <laughs> get a chance to make it and make New York better. I now can feel my creativity coming back. My heart is opening up again. I've been able to get back to my drumming, my dance, my singing, my herbalism. I started doing women's healing circles again, speaking to youth about alternative to violence. I've been through a lot, and I could call it tragic, but it's not tra tragic. It's a blessing. It's not all about me. A whole lot of other people are suffering like this. Men coming out of prison, women experience domestic violence, teens that have no place to stay. But it's not just them. I met brilliant women. When I say brilliant, brilliant women in the shelter system, women with PhDs. One, one was teaching at NYU and another one was working with the UN and that sister just got her apartment just a month ago and she just got a call just this week and she's gonna be doing some work for the people in Gaza. We deserve a place to stay and live, affordable. There are plenty of empty apartments all over New York. You can issue all the vouchers in the world, but if the landlords don't take them, they aren't worth the paper they're written on. What I love about Fair Housing Justice System sister, Center is that it's not just the filing of my suit that impacts so many and others, but there's accountability that makes vouchers what they are intended to be, a rollback home for New Yorkers in need, that yellow brick road, get out of Oz, get back home. All my life, New York really has been a village, a community where everyone stepped forward to help or teach when they have something to give. It happened with Valerie. She had faith and she told me to stand strong. It happened with the agent who said, I like your vibe, let me help you. It happened with my lawyer, Deborah, who told me to stand fast, don't worry. We got these guys, we're gonna wrangle them in. And it happened with Elizabeth. It happened with Stephanie and Jennifer and everybody who's been good to me since I've been on this road, this yellow brick road back home. There is no place like home. And it's happening right here and right now with all of you. I want to thank my team of Wonder Women. Deborah, Marianne, Heather, Elizabeth, and Marulika. And of course, my beloved mother, whose birthday is today, and all of my ancestors who taught me to be love, give love, just help when you can, and you'll be okay. 
And I want to thank Robin Hood for protecting the New York I love and the New York I am proud to call home. I finally got back home and I appreciate that. Continue the work, all of you who are out there giving, because when you give, you get back more than what the dollars. You get back people like me who come back and give back and we just keep New York what it's supposed to be, the international place where people come with their music, their arts, their politics, and they make changes. Thank you for being the merry men and women of Robin Hood, and I appreciate you, and I thank you on behalf of my mother, my ancestors, and all the honorees and everyone who's worked here today. And I say, God morning, because every day, God gives us a chance to start a new day. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Purnima Puri, and, um, and I've been involved in Robin Hood for 15 years. I joined Robin Hood uh, 15 years ago mostly because of the, I was inspired by the depth in which they engage in organizations, and Kind Work is a perfect example. Robin Hood is New York City's largest funder of workforce training. We invest in programs preparing low-income New Yorkers to get not just any job, but jobs with family sustaining wages on long-term career paths. This morning's next honoree is doing just that. Kind Work was founded in 2019 by tech industry veterans who saw a disconnect between hiring in their field and people who needed jobs. They quickly zeroed in on customer facing roles, middle skill positions critical to companies success that don't require backgrounds in computer programming or in web development. And they didn't require college degrees. At the same time, they noticed an alarming rate of people taking dead-end jobs, particularly those from low-income areas and communities of color. KindWorks six-week fellowship provides in-depth technical and professional training, job search support, and career coaching. 89% of people who complete the program get entry-level customer experience roles, mostly within one month of graduating. Kind workers earn average starting salaries of $46,000, so that's about twice what they might otherwise earn. They get great benefits and clear opportunities for advancement. So there's, there's four things that people need to remember. Six-week fellowship, no college degree, 89% of people are getting jobs, and they make $46,000 a year. So that's changing lives. Robin Hood provided guidance in KindWorks pilot phase and sought them out as a pillar of our COVID relief strategy to get New Yorkers back to work. We've been enthusiastic supporters as KindWorks grows their impact and undergoes a merger with another long-term Robin Hood grantee, Brooklyn Workforce Innovations. KindWorks identified a gap in the workforce and thanks to the high quality program, they've built extraordinary people like the one that you're about to meet are rising up to fill it every day for creating a robust new pipeline into careers in tech for talented young people. It is my honor to present this Robin Hood Hero Award to Kind Work and Euro Mies Bajé. Good morning, everyone. Being the, mom, being the daughter of a single mom means you know how to make things happen. There's not a lot of time to waste. As the oldest child and the first grandchild in a big Dominican family in the Bronx, I took on a lot of responsibility from a young age. My mom juggled two to three jobs, cleaning houses, and working all hours as a home health aide. So I picked up my sister after school, babysat on the weekends, and learned to wing it in the kitchen. My mom could never make it to parent-teacher conferences. 
but she had the phone number of the school office assistant and always called to check up on me. She never knew kids teased me for speaking Spanish or that I read the dictionary at lunchtime to get ahead. But she did know that I tested out of ESL as soon as I could. And by middle school, my English teacher praised my writing as college level. It was always instilled in me that I would go to college. But once I got there, it was very overwhelming. No one else in my family had ever been, and trying to figure it all out on my own caused a lot of anxiety. So I stopped going, and I took a job at a kid's dance school instead. After a year, I applied to be a patient care representative at a clinic in the Bronx. It felt like getting my first big girl job, like it might be the start of a real career. But, but management was not very engaged or encouraging, and eventually I was just going for the paycheck. Then COVID hit. I worked the front desk, registering and discharging patients. Everyone was sick. <laughs> it wasn't unusual to see the doctors crying. I knew I couldn't be working 12 to 13 hours, getting exposed, and potentially bringing the virus home to my grandparents. So I had to quit. Not long after, I found that I was pregnant. It became clear that I was gonna be the primary caregiver for my son. I was 25. Sorry. It was just the life that I, it was just, it wasn't the life that I imagined for myself. I started going to work with my mom every day just for the company. I was sleeping in her bed at night. Even in a crowded house, I felt so alone. After Bryson was born, I battled postpartum anxiety and depression. But mental health isn't talked about a lot in my community. I didn't know where to turn, but I needed to figure it out for Bryson. I applied to every customer service job I could find. Then I randomly went on Craigslist and saw a listing in tech. I always thought you had to know how to code, that you had to be the smartest of the smart, but this listing says something about free training for customer experience and tech. So I took a chance, I clicked on it, and sent in my application right before the deadline. I was really nervous, as always, but from the very first interview, everyone at Kind Work was so warm and welcoming. Bryson was only two months old at the time. I knew it was gonna be hard, but when I got accepted to the program, it felt like it was meant to be. Those next six weeks were intense. It was a two hour commune to Brooklyn, and I was really strict about getting myself there on time. I did most of my assignments in the middle of the night when Bryson was asleep. One day, Kind Work hosted an employer event. A manager from a FinTech company called Milio spoke. She talked about workplace culture and mentioned how she was a mother. And during the Q&A, I asked, how do you balance being a mother and building a career? She talked about how her family understands her goals and how she has a strong support system. And I started to imagine myself working for someone like her. Leading up to graduation, you're supposed to have one to two jobs a day that interest you in your job tracker. But I already had 30 in mind. <laughs> I kept telling myself, I'm leaving here employed. Then just before the program ended, I found out Melio was hiring for customer experience associates. The old me would have had an anxiety attack, but I leaned on my fellow kind workers for support and took it one step at a time. After five rounds of interviews and meeting over a dozen people at the company, I got an offer. So 
$65,000 plus equity that vests over four years. <laughs> 22 days of PTO, health insurance, an education stipend, an annual percentage gift towards my 401k. It was the best entry level package I've ever heard of. <laughs> Thank you. I was so happy I cried when I took kind work over Zoom. It felt like all my hard work was finally paying off. It's been a year now, and I love my job. I love helping customers solve complex problems and training new associates. My managers are always asking me, what do you want to do next? And all my coworkers know Bryson. I even bring him to the office sometimes. <laughs> I feel like I can be fully myself for the first time. Earlier this year, thanks to the money I've been saving up, Bryson and I moved into our own apartment. I got accepted to Lehman College where I'll finish my degree in business. <laughs> Thank you. I got accepted to Lehman College where I'll finish my degree in business administration and eventually get my MBA. I wanna be a first generation homeowner. I wanna have a big house where I can do family events without everyone being on top of each other. I want Bryson to have access to all the opportunities I didn't have. And I wanna help other people reach their full potential. Being a single mom was never in the plans. And at first, I feel like I failed. I know how much my mom sacrificed to give us a different life. And I felt like having a baby on my own was the one thing I was never supposed to do. But now, I'm like, yeah, I'm a single mom. A single mom with an amazing career. I'm gonna take this opportunity and run with it. Having my son has made me the best version of myself. Without kind work, I would have never known this life was attainable for me or for people who look like me. There's so much untapped talent in our communities. I truly believe it benefits companies to have people from different walks of life in one office. It brings more ideas and different perspectives that improve the business. It's a win-win. Anyone who knows me will tell you that I've always been terrified of public speaking. Can you tell? <laughs> I've, run out of, I've run out of presentations in front of crowds a fraction of this size. The fact that I'm up here today in front of over 400 of you proves the power of kind work, the quality of the training, the confidence I gained, and just how much they care. I'd like to thank my mom. Mom, thank you for all the time, energy. It comes again. Thank you for all the time, energy, and effort you put into me and my siblings and for taking such good care of Bryson. You give us so much so I can go to work and give it 100%. All of this is because of you. And I also want to thank all of you for investing in programs like Kind Work and BWI and for giving me and so many people like me the chance to go after our biggest dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Euromis. That was amazing. Uh, good morning to all of you and happy Thanksgiving. 
I'm Kristen Lemko, CEO of Wealth Management at J.P. Morgan Chase and proud, proud founding member of the Robin Hood Leadership Council. Each year, we come here and we remember how important it is to see each other as humans first. And that reminder couldn't be more important as we introduce the work of our final honoree this morning, New York Legal Assistance Group, or NILAG, as they are known to the world. NILAG is the one of the only organizations in New York practicing both family law and immigration law. And what's special is NILAG goes to where the need is, providing services at more than 150 community sites, courts, hospitals, and libraries. Last year, their staff of 350 impacted the lives of more than 129,000 people. I know there are a lot of math whizzes in this room. That works out to be 370 people 370 lives per staff member. Over the past two decades, Robin Hood has invested nearly $10 million in NILAG's efforts to combat economic, racial, and social justice. From $250,000 invested in capital projects to seed funding for their legal health program, now taken to scale and fully funded by the city of New York. Robin Hood has intentionally targeted our grants to impact the more than 60% of NILAG's clients who are immigrant women and survivors of domestic violence or sexual assault, terrified of being deported or separated from their children, too often these women remain in the shadows without legal representation and no viable pathway out of poverty. In 2022, Robin Hood stepped up again and assisted in the creation of the Pro Se Plus Project, a coalition of seven legal services and providers and community-based organizations such as NILAG and Venezuelan and Immigration Aid who educate and equip immigrants with the tools to represent themselves with assistance and oversight from lawyers. And at a time when lawyers can't possibly meet the growing demand, the Pro Se Project has vastly increased the reach of legal services and replaced fear with self-advocacy for so many immigrants across New York City. And so it is for those reasons and so many more I'm honored to present our final Hero Award of the Morning to NILAG, and here to share her extraordinary story with you is Yaris Lopez. Hi, good morning everyone. Good morning. I am so happy to be here to share my story with you today. Even in the worst situations, I have always been able to find what I like to call a little grain of salt. In every experience, there's an opportunity, and New York is the land of opportunities. As a native Garifuna, an indigenous population in Honduras, my family didn't have those opportunities. Many refused to even call me by my name. Black girl, they used to call me. When I was 11, our neighbors, so my younger sister's father, pouring gasoline outside of our house. He planned to burn us alive. My mom immediately packed us to leave for the US. I started screaming at her, something I have never done in my life. Why do we have to leave before my sixth graduation? Why can't we take her pretty clothes? She put her hair in ponytails and dressed us in sweatshirts and jeans three sizes too big. And then she told us my little sister couldn't come with us. My older sister and I were devastated, but my mom knew we couldn't leave the country with her without her father's permission. So we left her with my aunt. We have no other choice. We rode ferry trains, slept outside, walked for days. By the time we got to Mexico, we barely had any food or money left. Grown men started asking my sister and I, at just 11 and 13 years old, what would you do for $20? The cartels are known for kidnapping and sex trafficking young girls. And now I understand why my mom was trying to hide our bodies under layers of clothing and the 90 degree heat. When we finally began to cross the Rio Grande, the water was freezing. The waves could easily carry you away but my mom never let go of my hand. We went straight to the guards to tell them our names and our reasons for seeking asylum. If you ever saw the kids in cages on the news, that's where our American story began, in La Yelera, 
the icebox. There are no windows, no clocks, and you are barely allowed to go to the bathroom. We have nothing but foil blankets and food that has been expired for two months. I didn't understand English, but I could read that. When we were finally released, they gave us a sheet of paper saying we needed to appear in court, but it didn't say where or when. They were supposed to, they were supposed to contact us, but we have no address and no phone number. By the time I was enrolled in middle school, we were homeless, sleeping in parks and trying to get into shelter. But within eight months, I was speaking English. After a year, my mom met someone and we moved in with him. One day I called her on my way to the library. My mom always speaks off the phone, but she wasn't answering. Just go to the library, I told myself. Call her later. But something didn't feel right. I went home and she was unconscious. The man she was seeing, he got violent. I called 911 and once the police got involved, we met Allison from Nylect. She advocated for us in the persecution of my mom's abuser. She also found out we all had deportation orders on file with the court. We had no idea. Allison rescinded our deportation orders and reopened our case so we could have her day in court. My mom had to stay outside. If she set foot in the courtroom, she could have been deported immediately. My sister and I were so scared. But when I saw Allison confident arguing our case before the judge, my fear turned into curiosity. I thought to myself, I want that. That's when I decided I wanted to be an immigration lawyer. I did a search, found the Bronx High School of Law and Community Service. It meant switching schools and leaving the shelter every day at five in the morning, but it was worth it. I joined mock trial and started helping Allison navigate our legal case translating every document for my mom. Nyla helped us get medical care and therapy, secure work permits and our social security numbers. They got us metro car and food. My mom started working as a home health aide and I, and I started working as a, at a summer camp for kids who have witnessed domestic violence. By senior year, we still didn't have housing, but I started setting up college tours and trying to find financial aid. Then something incredible happened. My little sister crossed the border in Texas as an unaccompanied minor. With NILAC support, she was granted asylum within months. That was the legal status we needed to secure housing vouchers. And then in the spring of 2020, when the world shut down, our family finally completely moved into a three bedroom and two bathroom apartment in the Bronx, just in time for me to graduate as a valedictorian of my class. I was accepted to 12 colleges. <laughs> including Syracuse, but it only took me about two hours of being upstate to realize that New York City is where I belong. <laughs> I, I love the city that never sleeps. I get hungry at two in the morning. I need my bodegas, my bubble tea from Queens, but mostly I love that New York has a history of being immigrant friendly. And thanks to NILAC, that history becomes my family's reality. Last year, I started volunteering at the Pro State Plus Project, funded by Robin Hood. I got to file my first 589 application. I helped serve as a translator for a Venezuelan victim of torture in preparation for her trial. Usually, you have to be a law student to do that, but Allison knew I was up to the task. A week later, we found out our client was granted asylum. We won. <laughs> Thank you.
As an immigrant, you're always fighting the stereotype that you're a burden. But that day, I feel like a good luck charm. This spring, I will graduate from Lehman College. I want to continue working at the domestic violence shelter and volunteer a little longer before I apply for law school. But make no mistake, I will become an immigration lawyer. I will buy my mom a house someday. <laughs> I will also ensure that all of this has been worth it, not just for me, but for the thousands of immigrants fleeing discrimination and violence that come after me. Without NILAC, we wouldn't just have been deported back to Honduras. We would have been deported back to our dead. Allison, today is about heroes, and you are mine. I have learned so much from you. Thank you. To my mom, who's here today, you got us here, and everything that I have is because of you. I love you so much. I want to thank Robin Hood and all of you for giving us the opportunity to live in New York, the city of immigrants. Now is my turn to add my little grain of salt, and that's exactly what I intend to do. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wow. Morning, everybody. My name is Ken Tropin, and I'm a Robin Hood board member. I'm proud to say that I've been to every single hero's breakfast for more than 30 years. During that time, I've missed weddings, birthdays, and anniversaries, but I never want to miss a hero's breakfast. To me, there's nothing that compares to listening to the stories you heard this morning they are so incredibly inspirational and magical. Thank you to our heroes for having the courage to share your extraordinary journeys of advocacy, ambition, and bravery with us here today. What you've accomplished is simply phenomenal. When people ask me why I'm so passionate about Robin Hood, the answer is very simple. When I give to Robin Hood, I change people's lives. And no matter how much I give, I never change mine one bit. I've been blessed with all the luck in the world, and I feel a profound sense of responsibility to share my success, and Robin Hood has always tugged the strings of my heart like no other organization. Over the past 35 years, thanks to supporters like you, we've invested $150 million to open and support 177 charter schools. We've trained... <laughs> we've trained 200,000 individuals in workforce development programs, which translates to $7.8 billion in additional lifetimes earnings. Incredible. We've distributed $250 million in emergency relief to respond to crises like COVID or Hurricane Sandy or 9-11. When Robin Hood needs New York, we answer the bell. These highlights are some of the many ways that Robin Hood has helped New York City, as all of you well know. These are the kinds of things your generosity makes possible. This is what it means to be Robin Hood. Like many of you here today, I frequently get asked for help by quite a number of worthy organizations. However, when Robin Hood calls me for support, I'd like to tell you why I never say no. First, can I afford the request 
Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Second, do I know they will do an awesome job with my donation? I know firsthand they will and do. Third, is there any other charitable organization that's more effective in fighting poverty in New York City? The answer is absolutely not. Finally, and most importantly, is there something that I need to do financially that's more important than Robin Hood's work? For me, when I think about it, the answer is always a hard no. To our amazingly generous donors here today, we are eternally grateful to all of you. There is no way, no way Robin Hood accomplishes this most noble mission of fighting poverty in New York City without each and every one of you. On behalf of the entire Robin Hood board and every member of the organization, we can't thank you enough for your incredible support. Your generosity is truly inspirational. We greatly appreciate you joining us here on this beautiful morning and for carrying the generous spirit of Robin Hood in your, heart, in your hearts. Have a great day. Thank you very much. <laughs>